Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so that's why we keep focusing on Jesus and the way he can bless our country. Because we care about one another. We care about what goes on here. And uh, we just pray that we will be a part of what he's doing. In thinking about the history of our nation and thinking about ourselves right here and right now, I was struck by the idea that our founders said that they wanted to create a nation where you would not be put in prison for your particular brand of Christianity and how you particularly worshipped God in that way or not. Um, They said that, and I, I can't imagine how motivating that kind of a feeling has got to be to want to go from Europe all the way to the United States on a boat built in the 1600s or or 1700s. 1600s boat, 1700s boat. You've seen replicas of those, right? I mean, would any of you want to get in that kind of a boat and go all the way across the Atlantic Ocean? You know, I mean, that, you've got to be really motivated. And in looking at the historical kind of context, I mean, you know, I, I'm not a revisionist. I understand that there were certain folks that money is a motivating factor. And so, you know, there were certain folks coming over. They just wanted the wealth and the power and uh, were f- willing to enslave people and treat them horribly, those types of things. But that wasn't the whole story. You also had these folks that were so motivated to come over here because of that belief that worshiping God is worth it. We shouldn't give up on that. Now that in and of itself is a bit of a debate today, right? Not only would we maybe not want to go clear across the ocean in an old boat to do that, but maybe we just, you know, I don't even, I don't even care. I'm just not even going to listen. I'm not going to go to church or something. So, so not only they were so convinced that the worship of God is important, but also that our love of one another should be such that if you disagree with me on how we receive communion or how we baptize people or exactly how this particular part of the Bible should be interpreted, if you disagree with me on that, I should not have the right to put you in jail. I shouldn't have the right. And everybody says, amen, right? I mean, that's, yeah. And same here, you know? And for us, that's novel. But for, for them, I mean, that's, that, was, that was a big deal. I mean, so when they said they wanted to create that kind of country, that's one thing. But to then go off and do it. (laughs) Oh, we're going to go set up colonies and then we're going to work together and create these United States and we're all going to work together and then create a country that's based on these ideas that we put on a sheet of paper. Now, we all know how hard that is, right? We may make a New Year's resolution on a piece of paper and it may be hard for us just to manage ourselves to do that. But for them... They figured out a way to create a country. They said it. They taught it. They said this is important. And then they went and they did it. For me then, I'd like, to, I'd like to have that kind of connection between what I say and what I do so that it's consistent, it's not hypocritical, and somehow that can change history. Now, I'm not intending to go off and start a new country. Um, even if Scotty got the million dollars and she came to me and said, hey, let's set up our own country. Probably not enough money to do that, right? I mean, but can I be a part of something that changes history? Yeah, sure can. So can you. I've seen people say, my mom or my dad used to do this and it was horrible and it hurt us kids. And I decided for my family, I'm not going to do that to my kids. And they lived it out. And that changed the whole course of the next generation and the generation after that. I mean, that's crazy amazing, the amount of power we have when we decide, I want to be what I say that I want to be. I want to do what I say that I want to do. And I'm going to line that up with what God wants. And then I'm actually going to fulfill that somehow, some way. The early Christian leaders got that because Jesus said, I want to do only what the Father God says that I should do. I want to be one with the Father. So you've got this oneness, but also separateness. It's an amazing mystery but yet we can embody that ourselves as well as the early Christians did as they said, Jesus lived it out. He said he loved us, and then he went to the cross saying, I'm going to die for your sins. I'm going to take all the condemnation, all the curses on myself. He said it, he preached it, he taught it, and then he did it. And the early Christians said, that's a model we ought to follow. We ought to say those things that Jesus said are important to do, and then do them. One of the guys that was obsessed with this was named Paul. We know that as we read in the book of Acts. I'm going to read a little bit of Acts chapter 20. 
I'll start with verse 17. But Acts 20 and 21 is where we are as we've been studying the book of Acts. And, uh, and here's what we read. Acts 17, from Miletus, Paul sent F to Ephesus for the elders of the church. Now, Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, we know, is written to the elders in Ephesus. So this is a group that even when he was in Miletus, totally different town, the leaders in Ephesus were willing, the church Christian leaders, willing to come and meet with Paul. And Paul, he knows at this point that a lot is at stake and that he may be persecuted or even killed for his faith. And so he comes and it says in verse 18, when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. Now that's an interesting statement. Because as a leader, you know you're kind of out there in front of people. And he owned the responsibility of knowing they were watching him. And then he tried to live faithfully, not hypocritically. And then he reminded them, hey, look, you know how I lived. And at times, he would say, hey, thanks for giving me money that I can now live on and go preach to these people. But now as I get to these people, they are going to think that I'm all in it for the money. So I'm not even going to take anything from them. I'm going to work. I'm going to be a tent maker. I'm going to earn my own way. He points that out sometimes in his letters, and he's like, look, you saw wherever you were at, I tried to, to be sensitive to that. I tried to, to meet you where you are. And if you needed me to work, <clears throat> then I worked. And if you needed to just give, then I allowed you to give whatever you needed. So he's like, look, you know how I lived. Verse 19, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. <laughs> you know, he could point to that and say, how many of you have had a hit taken out on your life where assassins could get paid to kill you. <laughs> How many people could say that? All right, let's just do a poll. How many of you have had a hit out on your life? That would be fascinating. I would love to know that. No, I mean, you know, maybe you don't want to admit it, but not, yeah, not me either that I know of. Maybe I don't know, right? You might tell me that, you know, that'd be good. Um, but here you are. He's like, look, you know the severe testing I've gone through. Now that's important because these people need to be reminded that it's worth it. So verse 20, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. Hmm. So Paul talked a lot. We talked last week about how one time he preached so long that a guy sitting in a window fell asleep and fell out and died on the ground, right? So we know he talked a lot. He's owning it. He's like, look, you know I've preached. You know I've, ta I've told you what to do. And um, oh, and if you were not here, God raised the guy back to life. So, I mean, you know, so, you know, don't worry. If you fall asleep right now or, you know, you fall over dead, we're just going to pray for you. Bring you back, you know, right? You're ready, you're ready. So, um, he, you know that. You know that. You know what I've said. Paul's, he continues, verse 21. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. I remember, even though, there were people that wanted to kill him for it. He still said the truth that needed to be said. And now, verse 22, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. He knows the Holy Spirit wants him to go to Jerusalem. And he knows that there may be people there that are going to be mad at him. Because remember, when he was a religious persecutor and had the power of the Pharisees in Jerusalem to go and imprison people, and he did it, those people that gave him that power are still alive. They still live in Jerusalem. When he shows his face there, they're going to know, wait, you turned your back on us and decided to follow Jesus when we had been paying you to put Jesus followers in prison. And then you came back and you said, hey, they're right, you're wrong. We didn't like that. And we wanted to kill you then, and nothing's changed. We still want you dead because you're a blasphemer against God. He knows that that's going to happen, or at least he thinks perhaps, but the Spirit of God still wants him to go there. Verse 23, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, he continues, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. 
I mean, that's powerful. He's like, you know, and you could, you could picture, like, if he had a, a desk in his office at home and had, like, a little placard or a little, you know, picture with a particular thing on it to remind him of motivating him, you know, this kind of stuff, you know, he may say, finish the race, you know? And every time he thinks, don't give up. Any runner, you know, you, you reach a point. Um, for me, it's like the first 10 minutes of running uh, where you just want to give up, right? Janine, it's like, Three hours into it, you know, she might want to give up. You know, it's like, oh my gosh. But sometimes you reach kind of that wall. And sometimes if you push through it, you get, you get your second win. You're okay. But a lot of people want to quit, you know. And he had to remind himself, don't give up. Don't give up. Run the race. Finish the race. Complete the task. Even if prison or hardships or difficulties may face us. We remind ourselves, don't give up. Keep going, keep going. For Paul, it took a lot of effort to go from Greece back to Jerusalem. Just the trip is dangerous. Old boats, cranky camels. I mean, you know, you've got craziness. And then he's going to be facing persecution. And that's exactly what happens. In chapter 21, verse 13, uh, we find out Paul goes into the temple to worship. Now, he's Jewish. He goes to the Jewish temple because that's what Jews are supposed to do. And he respected that tradition. But he didn't say that Gentiles had to do that. He was like, well, look, you know, Jesus set us free from the law. But that made the Jewish leaders mad. They're like, no, we do not accept that Gentiles don't have to first become Jewish to be on God's team. We don't accept that Jesus would take them in. But Paul was like, I'm not going to give up. Even if you're mad at me, even if you'll imprison me or persecute me, I'm not going to give up. So he goes there to worship. And what do they do? they start to want to imprison him. And remember, they've got religious police. They've got temple guards that can do that. And then the Roman leaders of the town are freaking out. They're like, no, we can't have a, a riot at the temple because then the, the Roman leaders in Rome are going to hear that yet again, we've got an uprising in Israel. We've got to send in all of our, our military to go slaughter everybody and just straighten them all out, which happened in 70 A.D., so they know this is a reality that could happen because it happened before. They don't know exactly when it may happen again. But, you know, the Jews and, and the Romans, man, they're just clashing. So the Romans are like, we've got to put a stop to this. And they find out, well, well, look, this guy Paul is the main problem. And so then they take him into custody. They arrest Paul. And then Paul's like, hey, you've you got to treat me a little different because I'm a Roman citizen. I'm a citizen of this Roman Empire. Like his family, I mean, they, they had become something in in the Roman eyes and so now they're like oh dear and so Paul's like hey eventually he says well put me on trial in Rome we'll get to that in the next few weeks and so he's going to get to go to where he had told Christians I want to go I want to go and preach in Rome he's going to get a free ticket (laughs) on you know government funded except he's going to be a prisoner when he gets to Rome but this is all going down in Jerusalem right here now again He lived what he taught. He did what he preached. He practiced what he preached. If I were then looking at all of this, a passage that then stands out to me, that I'm then like, oh, okay, this is part of why this was such a big deal for Paul. I would go to chapter 20, verse 26. I don't have that scripture up on the screen. I just want you to listen to it, knowing that he was willing to stand on this, even if it cost him other people gathering around him, mad at him, wanting to beat him, wanting to kill him. Even if it cost him that, he wanted to have a free conscience. Here's what he says. I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Think about that. I I bet that was something that he would even say in that context when they're all shaking their finger at him and they're mad and they're trying to beat him and he's standing there in the middle of them, I can picture Paul saying, I am innocent of your blood. I have spoken the truth to you. I have lived it out. I have tried to be authentic at pointing to Jesus. You can't find a really good, solid, legitimate reason to want to kill me. You may be mad that I preached too long, you know, and then the guy fell out the window. You may be mad that I travel around a lot, and there were people that were mad at him for that, right? Yeah, he'd go here and go there, and they're like, wait, come back. And he's like, no, the God, God's... So he's like, yeah, you may be mad at me at that, but I am innocent of your blood. When you stand before God, and God says, did you hear the truth 
those people around Paul are going to have to say, yeah, we did. And Paul's like, so my life is not as important in terms of safety for myself as it is telling you the truth. Now for us, I mean, that's a big challenge to say there are people around us and we are altering history with what we do, you know? If I am in a drive through window and I start yelling at the person that's giving me my stuff because we all know they're only about 50% accurate at any given time and so you've got multiple opportunities to go off on somebody and you could go off on them right then and all the rest of their history of their life, whatever it is that you say, they might remember. I mean, that's freaky, right? But we know that's true. We don't get to select what we remember. Some of us, our dads were so mad at us that he said something horrible, and then we remember that. I have multiple people in my family where that's what, what it was. I mean, I, 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 I know one says that his dad would say stuff like, you're no good, you'll never be any good. I mean, he still remembers that. He doesn't want to. We alter the course of history with what we do. Paul challenges us, make sure that what we do and say puts us free from the guilt of anybody's blood. How do we do that? Well, in the Bible, we're challenged to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Guess what group of Christians Paul wrote that to? The Ephesians. Ones that the elders he had looked at and said, you know how I lived. You know it. And and, and this whole idea, I'm, I'm not guilty of anybody's blood because I've tried to both speak it and I've tried to live it out. And if you spit on me or tried to kill me, I still loved you back. I have returned it with some way of serving you. That is cool. When I think about people that have, have impacted my life, and as you think about people that have really encouraged you, wasn't it somebody that was pretty much the opposite of a hypocrite? Right? You know, like... Like they said one thing and then they did it. They said they loved you and then they helped you. Or they, they, you know, they, they said, hey, I care about your education, so I'm going to invest in my time. Like even though you're kind of a punk kid sometimes, I'm still going to try to help you, right? You know, they, they practiced what they preached. They did what they said. They did what they taught that should be done. For me then, I look at them and I look at our founders who are trying to do that and think about other people in, in my life. And I'm like, okay, I noticed that a lot of them decided first of all, I don't want to be this. So think for yourself. What do you not want to be? What do you not want to be? (laughs) I don't want to be the person that does that or says that or something. Like for me, um, I don't want to be a loser husband and an absentee father. Like I obsess about not being a loser husband and an absentee father. Does that make sense? I mean, for you, there's something else, right? That's like, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. But, but we know we don't want to just focus on what we don't want to be. We want to focus on what we want to be. So that second question would be, well, then what do you really want to be? What do you want? What do you want? What, what is it that God is putting in your heart and your soul to say, this is the way that I want you to be and live? This is going to be beautiful. This is going to be right. And you think about that. You say, man, yeah. If I could be like that, that would be something. That would, that would alter people's history in ways where I'm lifting them up, I'm encouraging them. I'm speaking the truth that may hurt for a bit, but it may be helpful. I mean, can't we all say that there have been times when somebody has told us the truth and we might have even been mad at them or, you know, it, it hurt, it hurt bad, but yet we were better off because they said it and they didn't wimp out? Hmm, it's good. So then the third thing then, as we're thinking about all that, God, how do you want me to speak the truth and do the truth in love? Is there some self-correcting way that I need to kind of correct myself through your help, get back on the right track? Is there something I've said or done, or is there a habit that I'm doing where I'm like, whew, I've got to tame that, or I've got to get rid of that? How, hmm, are we holding back truth? because we want to be nice. I mean, I struggle with that, right? Sometimes I'd rather be nice than true and honest, right? I mean, don't we all like to be liked? 
And, and some of you are like, no, that means nothing to me, which means you may be on the other side of the fence and you're speaking truth, speaking truth, speaking truth, and everybody around you is like, man, I am bloody and bruised from what you're saying, right? And it may, not, it may all be true, but how we do it, it's got to be in love. Otherwise, we haven't fulfilled the scripture. So we've got to have both somehow. Speak the truth in love. Quick prayer, one final story, and then we receive com- Holy Communion. Here's the prayer. God, as we see those things that need to be corrected, would you change us? Help us to accept that we need to own wherever we've fallen short or hurt people or not spoken the truth. Help us to confess it, turn to you, and resolve to do different because of what you're doing in our lives. And this Holy Communion, where we commune with your spirit, may that be real and true today for us. So that we can leave this place more ready to be what you've called us to be and to say what you've called us to say. Come, Holy Spirit, make that true. Amen. Encouraging story I read in a book, Business by the Book, (laughs) which is a book about how to be a business person that follows Jesus guy named Roy um, in the books by Larry Burkett and he used it in another illustration as well which he presented as a true story so I'm going to assume it's true. Roy had a desk that he thought was Thomas Jefferson's desk that had been lost over time throughout the Civil War. Now that'd be worth a lot of money right but then as he was looking at it and in particular he's opening the drawers and stuff and he's looking really closely at the wood and he's like the wood's not right. That's not from the right place and, and time and everything. It's just not right. He's very disappointed, but he's like, it's a beautiful desk. And he was a, an auction house guy where he would sell things at the auction. So he puts it up for auction. A lady's like, oh, I'll give you a hundred dollars for that. It's a beautiful desk. It's really, really cool. It'll fit well in my house. And he's like, okay. You know, and so, I mean, you know how the, the stuff goes. So she says, I'll come back tomorrow and I'll, I'll have all the money. I'll buy it. He says, that's fine. I'll save it for you. No problem. His friend comes by later who knows this stuff better than he does. And he says, you've got, I think, Thomas Jefferson's desk that we knew existed because of his journals and stuff, but we've never known where it is, and it was lost in the Civil War. Like, this is it. Like, I think this is it. And Roy's like, no, let me show you. And he shows them the inside of the drawers and stuff, and they look at it, and they're like, no, this is not it. But his friend's like, wait, no, it's just the inside of the drawers. Those have been redone, but this is the real desk. And Roy's like, oh no, that means it's like worth $100,000. And and his friend's like, no, it's worth like $200,000. Like, this is crazy. Have you sold it? And Roy's like, no, I, well, yeah, I have. Like, I told the lady she could buy it for $100. $100, are you stupid? And he's like, ah. So his friend's like, well, just make up an excuse. You know, find another desk. Tell her, you know, you you made a mistake. You can't sell it and that kind of stuff. Hmm, because lying is worth $200,000, right? I mean, you know, if you get $200,000 for telling the lie, that's worth it, right? I mean, that's what his friend is saying, but that's not right. It's not what Jesus would do. And Roy had been a a Christian, and he had said, I'm going to follow Jesus. And so he's like, no, I've got to be honest. So the lady comes in, and he's honest with her and says, look, I'm going to sell you this for $100, but I've got to be honest with you. If you take it to another auction, and they really investigate this, you're probably going to get like $200,000 from this. But it's not right for me to withhold it from you because I told you I'd sell it. Then the lady replied back to him, it's not right for me to, tr- to, to do that to you. You didn't know what you had. That's not fair. Find me another desk that looks like that or make me one that looks like that and I'll buy it for the $100 and you do with that one whatever you want. I mean, he's floored, right? I mean, that never happens in the real world, but for him it did. Sometimes when you do good, like it comes back doubly. Not all the time in this life, but always in eternity, and you've always got a clear conscience. So he goes off, he sells it, over $200,000. He comes back, he splits the money with the lady and gives her a desk that he had custom made just for her. And he's like, look, it's still not right for me to keep all this. Let's, let's share, because this is beautiful. Now that's awesome. But when you're tempted... <laughs> to go the other way or to not say what you should say or to do something that's not in love you may have some immediate gratification you may even get rich doing that but it's not worth it it'll eat at you and then when we stand before God mm, definitely not going to be worth it then so today's the day to get it right 
Holy Communion represents Jesus making it right for us. His body was broken for us. His blood was spilled, poured out on the cross for us. When I say us, that means you and me and everybody around you. Let's pray. God, bless these elements, the bread, the cups, that you would commune with us by your Holy Spirit as we eat and we drink. Remembering Jesus' last supper when he blessed the bread with his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. And he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant between God and you through me. God, we stand in that new covenant agreement with you that Jesus' death and resurrection counts for us and enables us to receive the Holy Spirit's help and power in our lives. Commune with us now, in Jesus' name, amen.